Okay, I'm reading out of this book right here. And this is volume two. And this, of course, is Moses being put in the basket. And this is his sister Miriam. And right now, in this book, we're at part three. Stories of the Exodus. Exodus 11 through 18. Part 3, Story 1, Blood on the Doorpost. What is that? Okay, and it does have a nice, pretty painting, copy of a painting, by Arlo Greer. 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 Yeah. Excuse me. Of Arlo Greer. And... This is what it is, what it looks like, and they had, I don't care what you've heard, it was a special herb that they dip and put the markings on. And this is the caption for this painting. It says, this night when Israel was to leave Egypt, every parent sprinkled the blood of a lamb on the doorpost of his house to show he believed in God. Believed God would save his family from death. And that's what it was. And let's get back in to part three. Story one, blood on the doorpost. On that last afternoon in Egypt, every human father and mother had a secret worry. If it is true, and Moses, as Moses said, that the angel of death is coming that night and smite all the firstborn in the land, would he make, would he make no mistakes? Would he be sure to tell the difference between an Egyptian's home and a Hebrew home? In, dark, in the darkness and with so many houses to visit, might he not enter the one of them in error? See, there's, that's the question. To make sure that the Hebrew, that the Hebrews would not suffer from this last awful plague, God told them to take the blood of a lamb and sprinkle it upon the doorpost of their home. And when I see the blood, he said, I will pass over you. And who, all who believed that God was with Moses did as he said. They took a lamb or a baby he goat, killed it, Oh, sorry for this. And smeared the blood on the doorpost of their home. At sunset that evening, at sunset that evening, the spark sprinkling of blood was going on throughout the land of Goshen. Wherever a faithful Hebrew lived, every Everywhere men and women ask each other, is the blood sprinkled on the door, is the blood sprinkled on your door, on your home? And if the home was seen to have, to be without blood on the doorpost, neighbors would bang on the door and cry, don't forget the blood. It must have been quite a sight, and each family standing outside its home as the father holding a basin of blood in one hand and a sprig of hyssop in the other, sprinkling first one doorpost and then the other. In every case, the most interesting onlooker was the oldest son, the firstborn whose life was at stake. 
you can be sure that he made certain the job was well done. There many have there may have been some who why do you have to sprinkle blood on our do doorpost anyway? What good can this do for us? If so, they soon learn. It was dangerous not to put up God's sign of safety. Thousands of lambs must have died at that last evening for Israel to sit that thousands of lambs must have died that last evening that Israel spent in Egypt. Every one of them was a symbol of Jesus, the Lamb of God, which taketh away sin from the world. The blood sparkling on the doorpost was likewise a symbol of the blood of Jesus, which was shed for many and which cleanses us from the from all sin. Got to think this is 1953 and everybody's still in the Judeo Christian faith, or most some people were. When like when we like the Hebrews in Egypt obeys God's word and do as He says. When we accept Jesus as our Savior and as it were sprinkle his blood upon the doorpost of our heart of our hearts, then he will forgive us our sin and will pass over us in days in the day of judgment. This is what the Apostle Paul meant when he said Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. What happened to the lamb whose blood was sparkled on the doorpost? It was roasted whole and eaten by the whole family. And it was eaten in haste, with everybody fully dressed and ready to leave at a moment's notice. So it it was drained and then it was cooked pretty much because a lot of times I would whenever I read this when I was a little I didn't understand what but they would basically have big barbecue pretty much and they were good they cooked this in haste getting ready because they're ready to leave got everything ready whether anybody slept that night, I don't know. I doubt it. The Egyptians may have for an hour or two, but not the Hebrews. Fathers and mothers were too busy packing and getting things ready for the long journey ahead of them. As for the children, they were far too excited. Everybody must have been eagerly waiting for the signal to go. Tired as they were, this was no night for sleep. Suddenly a dreadful sound rose on the midnight air. From all the land of Egypt came the screams of frightened women mingled with the wails of thousands of people mourning their dead. The Egyptians who were killed who had killed so many of the Hebrew children were learning what it meant to lose their own. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh that sat upon on, sat on his throne upon the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. And then of course we got two illustrations. The one on this top right here is 
their version of the Angel of Death. And then here down at the bottom is they're getting ready to go. They got everybody in the building and ready to go. And then the next page, it says, this was the last and most terrible, terrible of all plagues, and it brought Pharaoh finally to his knees. The Bible said he rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there in the great, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron that night and said, Rise up and get ye, get you forth from among my people, both ye and your children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds and be gone. With the death of everyone in Egypt, the people had no desire to keep the Hebrews any longer. They wanted them to go now. They were urgent that they might send them out of the land in haste. They had... They even heap more silver and gold and clothing upon them in their anxiously anxiety. Was that anxiety? Yeah. In their anxiety for them to be gone. Anything the Hebrews asked for, they were given. So it was that they spoiled the Egyptians. They spoiled the Egyptians. That means they took everything. That was one of the great, one of the greatest night, nights of history. A night when a nation was born. A night when million slaves set free. A night to be remembered through all time to come. And it was on that night that God promised that God's promise to Abraham came true. Long ago, he had told his faithful servant that after 400 years, his children would be delivered from Egypt, Egyptian bondage. Now the time was up and they were free again. Now they could go back to their homeland from which they had yearned for so long, yearned long ago. And then the little illustration is kind of a sad one, but it's Pharaoh and his, sorry, his firstborn son. And that was part three, story one, and let me set everything up for the next one, and see you in a bit.